So today we are very lucky um, to have Dr. Suresh Mativanan from Latrobe University uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Suresh has been uh, a pioneer uh, in EV research uh, and he's been focusing mostly on uh, different populations of extracellular vesicles from cancer cells, but not only um, from cancer cells. And he's one of the pioneers in proteomic studies um, of EV populations. And the title of his talk today is Extracellular Vesicles in, Ca in Cancer Progression and Cross-Species Communication. I'll let you go ahead. Thanks, Dolores, and thanks, Carolina, for the invite, and thanks uh, for your kind words as well. So I'll share the screen right away, right now. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to uh, present um, a completely unpublished data on um, the role of uh, extracellular vesicles in cancer progression and cross-species communication. Um, and <clears throat> some of you would have heard uh, this talk uh, previously, but um, yeah, I'm happy for it to be shared online uh, as well as uh, even though it's not published. So uh, I come from this uh, university, Latrobe University, as uh, Dolores pointed out, uh, and I currently serve as the director for uh, Research Center of Extracellular Vesicles in Latrobe, uh, which is kind of a, a group of 10 teams where, um, like, for example, you know, Andy Hill, the president of ISERV, uh, he currently runs a lab in Latrobe where they're focused on neurogenitive diseases. Uh, we also have uh, Ivan Poon, uh, who works on apoptosis, Maria, bacterial. Likewise, we have somewhere like uh, 10 uh, groups who are predominantly interested in extracellular vesicles and various um, uh, applications in terms of disease, as well as in biogenesis of them, uh, as well as in method development. So my lab, um, uh, in terms of uh, what we focus on, uh, again, you can divide that into two teams where we are interested a lot on uh, extracellular vesicle uh, biology and their role in uh, uh, mainly cancer progression. And uh, on the red side here, so these are all the topics that we are interested in in the context of extracellular vesicles or EVs, right? So we're interested in chemo resistance, uh, cancer progression, the role of EVs in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, in addition, we also study some, um, uh, how these EVs are made up by the cells uh, we predominantly use cell biology and biochemical techniques to understand uh, how these uh, cells make them up. And also uh, a little bit on wind signaling, where we look at uh, the role of wind signaling in EVs, as well as the role of EVs in wind signaling. Uh, plus also, uh, we have been instrumental in uh, developing these uh, bioinformatic resources like Exocata, Vesiclepedia, and Fundrich that has been widely used by the community. Uh, and also we do have some side projects, for example, uh, so we have been working on fungal EVs, yeast EVs and milk EVs, where we initiated them as a part-time based project with Curiosity. Uh, and also non-EV projects are also happening in the lab, which, which I won't go into. But the purpose of today's talk is mainly going to be, uh, I'm going to focus on milk EVs and uh, cross-species communication. Um, um, Dolores has heard this talk twice or so, but uh, where um, we stumbled upon uh, this study as a, a curiosity-based research, and we asked, started asking some simple questions, and that became a, a bigger project later on, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Right? So for the purpose of uh, people who are uh, coming from a non-EV background, I'll just give a brief introduction. So uh, extracellular vesicles, um, here I'm classifying uh, the EVs in general in terms of all population of uh, extracellular vesicles which are secreted by the cells. Uh, we have the exosomes which are thought to be derived from the endocyte endosomes. Pretty much when the endosomes or the multivesicular bodies fuse with the plasma membrane, they release the exosomes outside. And also we have blubbing that is happening from uh, the plasma membrane that results in a larger vesicles which are also kind of uh, uh, coming into the subclass of uh, extracellular vesicles in general. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to call them extracellular vesicles. We understand there's a lot of heterogeneity in these, and we cannot purify any one uh, EV subtype to 100% homogeneity. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm just going to call everything extracellular vesicles from here on. 
So again, for uh, people who are uh, new to this field, again, um, uh, you can see this is a video from NIH XRNA Consortium, where you can see one oncogenic or a cancer cell, which secretes uh, extracellular vesicles constitutively. And this has the potential to change the phenotype of the recipient cell uh, quite quickly. And this is based on the context. Um, so it, it is kind of uh, uh, well known in the field that EVs are implicated or involved in intercellular communication. Uh, but however, I need to be uh, conscious in saying that there are not too many in vivo studies where people have looked at it constitutively, how it uh, kind of um, orchestrates uh, intercellular communication or their role in physiology is still uh, uncovered. So um, again, uh, to start off this story, so in, in uh, this study started pretty much in 2012, right? So almost eight years ago, where you have this uh, study which was published uh, by Nanjing University where uh, Zhang group kind of proposed this particular study where they took serum from healthy individuals who consumed rice and they found rice RNA being circulating in the serum of the people who consume rice, right? And then they went about uh, showing that this rice RNA can regulate gene expression in the host organism who consumes it. Meaning now this particular microRNA was able to be circulating in the, plas uh, in the serum and then it can change the gene expression in some of the tissues and thereby the phenotype of the organism. Right. And this created a lot of interest. And uh, I remember discussing with uh, many of my colleagues about this. And then uh, there was some skepticism and some people were uh, really uh, um, encouraged by this finding saying that, okay, it could be true. And there's a lot of skepticism in the field as well. But the authors kind of uh, uh, proposed um, a mechanism like how these RNA are surviving the gut is via EVs. Right. They proposed this mechanism of either EVs can survive the gut via uh, endo, uh, like transendocytosis, where the epithelial cells can take them up on one side and leave on to the other side. Similarly, they also proposed uh, uh, another option of uh, where uh, the EVs can uh, pass through the leaky epithelial barrier and get into the bloodstream. Right? But there is no data whatsoever to confirm these. These are all uh, speculations at the moment. Uh, but uh, these are all the hypotheses that are currently out there, right? As I said to you that this study has been, um, uh, has received a lot of skepticism and the hypothesis has been refuted by multiple studies. And here you can see uh, in the scientists that this plant RNA paper was questioned. Uh, and in the same year, like 2012, when it was published, the same year we had several people kind of uh, raising their alarms. Uh, and it was followed by many research articles where uh, some of them, like for example, this Nature Biotech article, where they knocked out a specific microRNA in mice and they fed that knockout uh, animal uh, with uh, the specific microRNA enriched diet. And they were not able to identify this microRNA in serum, circulating in the serum. So somehow, uh, using this powerful model, they were able to kind of refute the hypothesis that was proposed by the authors initially. Right? So now imagine, um, for you to refute a hypothesis, uh, we all do know that you need to do much more experiments than uh, you kind of climbing something for the first time. And that's what happened in many of the studies. And several people have uh, refuted this hypothesis. And you can see multiple review articles in the field uh, regarding uh, the same. So uh, we, at that time, um, we thought, okay, let's throw our hat into this question. And we started uh, by asking a simple question. Let's look whether EVs from diet can survive the gut, right? And we thought of uh, a diet that, uh, a dietary uh, fluid or a, a diet that could be consumed by a lot of people. And then that has a lot of EVs. And the one that came to our mind was pretty much wine milk. And hence, we started uh, uh, using uh, bovine milk for this particular analysis. And we do know that milk is uh, one of the um, most consumed beverage throughout the world. And it's been long been associated with good health, as, uh, as we do know. And also in terms of um, uh, many of the benefits are, uh, 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 many of the benefits are uh, 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 implicated with uh, milk consumption. 
right? And in average, uh, a single person has been estimated to consume somewhere like 170 mil a day. And I'm talking about people who are not uh, lac uh, lactose uh, uh, tolerant and not, I'm not talking about those lactose intolerant people. And this is the general stat that is around the world, right? Um, and there's a lot of proteins, EV proteins that is present in this milk. And this patent here estimated somewhere like uh, um, 600 mg of protein in, uh, in uh, this amount of milk that one, one person consumes every day. So we started asking the questions like, do EVs in bovine milk have a functional role, right? And can they survive the gut? Our initial hypothesis was, we'll just test this question. If EVs can survive the gut, we'll follow up with the project. If not, we'll just quit the project and say, okay, this is, uh, we also refute the hypothesis and we move on to other projects, right? So um, we started asking simple questions in a way, are EVs from bovine milk, which are consumed by, uh, consumed orally, we're not trying to give them by intravenous or by IP, we are just giving them by oral delivery, just mimicking if someone drinks milk EVs, right? Are they retained by the system? And if they are retained by the system, how are they distributed among various organic organs? Secondly, we ask the question in, in terms of do EV uh, proteins play uh, any role in general mammalian physiology and well-being? Uh, also, do they have any immunomodulatory effects? And uh, lastly, we also wanted to study their role in cancer progression because we as a lab are interested in uh, cancer biology a lot. So we started off uh, um, optimizing the methods for isolating EVs from uh, bovine milk. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we kind of use a series of differential centrifugation followed by ultra centrifugation, and then finally do optiprep density gradient centrifugation to isolate EVs from milk samples, right? And this methodology has been published in a scientific reports uh, article, uh, which is uh, been uh, given below. So um, once we isolated the EVs, we had to characterize them, and that's pretty much the norm in the field as per uh, MICEF guidelines. Uh, we use two kinds of milks here. One is the raw milk. These milk are not pasteurized, not homogenized. We got them directly from the farmers, uh, and these uh, represent multiple batches and uh, many cows in general, right? And also we took EVs from commercial milk, which are commercial uh, means that we got from local groceries. We pooled five to six brands together, and then we isolated EVs from them. So as you can see here, we show a Western lot for EV enriched protein, TSG101, uh, and also transmission electron microscopy to show that there are vesicles in the preparation, and also NTA to show that peak is like 145 and 135 for these EVs. As I said initially in, in the uh, EV introductory slide, these populations are heterogeneous. You can see some of them are up to 300, uh, a minor uh, population of these vesicles. And uh, we thereby, thereby call them extracellular vesicles. And this is what we see uh, in the milk per se. So then uh, we also characterize them by proteomics and RNA-seq. And for proteomics, we did it in-house uh, in the lab. For RNA-seq, we used uh, Andy Hill's uh, group and Leslie Cheng's help to analyze the RNA uh, that is present in this commercial milk and raw milk EVs. Uh, to cut the long story short, so what we found out was, uh, in spite of different batches of milk from different cows, in spite of different uh, uh, processing like homogenization and pasteurization, we can see certain cargo like the proteins in RNA are indeed conserved between um, uh, raw milk and commercial, uh, commercial milk EVs, but there's also differences suggesting that probably some of them may be coming because of batch variation as well as uh, uh, the difference in uh, uh, the, uh, the homogenization and pasteurization methods. Um, so that's what we found out from this particular analysis. So next we asked the question um, about biodistribution. So let's take, uh, take the EVs from this milk um, and label them with this lipophilic dye DIR, uh, which, is, um, which is a lipophilic dye, as, as I mentioned, it just only labels the uh, lipid layer of uh, the EVs, and then orally gavage them into mice. Again, I have to reiterate this point. We are orally gavaging, we're not using IV, so that we can mimic if someone drinks milk, what happens, right? So now, uh, these, the concentration that we used were physiologically relevant. 
what we did here is if we calculate a 62 uh, kilogram human consumes 177 mil a day, we would uh, equate that to uh, 20 gram mice, somewhere like 60 to 70 microliter of uh, milk. And that's the amount of EVs we started gavaging into these. And then we uh, started uh, harvesting the organs at a certain time point and seeing whether these EVs can survive the gut and reach the organs. And this is the data here. At, after 24 hours of, uh, uh, of injecting or orally giving uh, these mice with EVs, you can see the PBS alone group don't have any signal, uh, but the RM, the raw milk EVs, which are labeled with dye, you can see after 24 hours, you can see a lot of signal in the liver, the heart, uh, you can see the kidney and spleen light up, and this is quantified here, right? As control, we have used the dye alone control, which is the DIR alone. As you can see, the dye alone can diffuse a little bit. Uh, and also we use the sonicated EVs, which mean you rupture the membrane of the EVs uh, and then uh, um, pretty much orally gavage that to the mice as well. And as you can see, both DIR and sonicated EVs have a basal level of signal, suggesting that the dye can diffuse, uh, uh, kind of raising some cautionary note here. But however, the signal is quite uh, significant compared to the controls, as you can see in the quantification plot here. So this kind of suggested as probably the EVs can survive the gut and reach there. But however, I was skeptical. So we, had, we are kind of uh, relying on a dye, right? So what if the dye diffuses and what if fragments of proteins reach there? Um, so I wasn't confident with this data, even though it suggests probably it is reaching there. So we thought, okay, let's kind of back it up with some other experiments to see whether we can reproduce these results, right? So we went back to um, uh, proteomics uh, in this particular interest, interest. So the question that we asked here is, if these milk EVs are surviving the gut and reaching the organs, can we detect this bovine proteins in the liver or other organs of the species? We chose liver because at 24 hours, liver seemed to be having the higher concentration of EVs in them than any other organ. So we thought, let's start with the liver. And when we took the liver and did proteomics on them, we were able to identify bovine specific proteotypic peptides, right? Which span more than 125 proteins. So what I mean by proteotypic peptides are, these are peptides which are coming only from the bovine genome. No other organism, including bacteria, has these peptides in their genome, suggesting that what we see are indeed true, right? And even when you look at the coverage of the proteins which we identify, there are more than 80% uh, coverage in some of the proteins suggesting that they are indeed full length and they are reaching to the organs per se. And we're pretty confident by seeing this data, saying that we're not only basing it on dye, plus also proteins going into the organs. So um, then we started asking the question. So now we see these guys surviving in the gut. So what happens to cancer? So if you have an animal with a, a, a cancer condition, uh, does it kind of, uh, accelerate cancer progression in this mice or slow down cancer progression. So we kind of used the xenograft mice, which is a colorectal cancer, SW620 cells in this particular scenario. Uh, and we created a xenograft uh, by subcutaneous injection. And then we orally gavaged milk EVs to this mice. And we started monitoring the primary tumor in this mice. So our hypothesis here was milk EVs aid in cancer progression because uh, we are the only mammal who are consuming milk, right? So have, have anyone thought about that? Like what, who made us drink milk? Because we are supposed to drink milk only after birth. And after a while, we're supposed to stop that. Now, because we are humans and we can, we are drinking milk throughout our life. And is that physiologically relevant? And would that have some repercussions in us? And these are the questions we had. And when you think about milk EVs per se and milk in general, these are attributed to growth and development. And I thought maybe by putting milk EVs into these mice, you are going to aid in cancer progression is what my thought was to start these experiments in the first place. Uh, but to my surprise, when we orally gavage the raw milk and commercial milk EVs to these mice, we can see the PBS alone group, that's the red one. You can see the tumor volume is quite big. But moment we give raw milk or commercial milk EVs, the tumor volume is significantly reduced 
in these xenograft models, suggesting that milk EVs is good for reducing the primary tumor burden, right? And that was surprising to me. And then we asked the question whether milk EVs are reaching to the primary tumor, and that's what the case is, because milk EVs are directly going to the primary tumor, and we could validate this uh, by uh, even proteomics as well. So now, um, this kind of data was striking for me. At that time, there was nothing in literature about this. So we had to repeat this with uh, uh, two other staff, like postdocs and students, and all of them got reproducible results. And I can say this now confidently that there's no other data that is as reproducible as this. Even five microgram of milk EVs can reduce the primary tumor burden in all the cancer models that we have studied. We have studied in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and pancreatic cancer, and it's quite significant uh, in this particular aspect. Um, so uh, with this in account, so then we start, okay, let's look at metastasis, right? So now, still now we studied primary tumor burden, and what happens to metastasis, right? And in this scenario, we also wanted to throw in another angle here, because previously we did a xenograft study, which was done in an immuno, uh, compromised mice. We wanted to include an immunocompetent background, and that's why we use this 41 breast cancer model, which are syngenic models. Um, that's why uh, we kind of selected it. And we did uh, the memory fat pad injection of 41 in these cells, like orthotopic models, and then we let the cancer to spread uh, to lungs, and uh, we also started orally administering milk EVs to these mice. Right? And here our hypothesis was milk EVs may attenuate cancer metastasis because it reduces primary tumor burden. Right? And now we have something in our hands which kind of is beneficial for uh, reducing the primary tumor. And we thought, okay, let's take it further and see whether it can also attenuate cancer metastasis. So consistent with the previous data, we could see even in breast cancer, the primary tumor burden is quite significantly reduced in both the raw milk and the commercial milk groups. So we also had a low and a high group. So low is the physiologically relevant concentration, which is 500 micrograms or 25 mg per kg per mice, or the high is the 1000 micrograms or 50 mg per uh, kg. So why we use this high dose is just to see whether the milk EVs can be curated. We saw them, yes, they are reducing the primary tumor burden. We wanted to see whether they can be really, really curated here by reducing it further but it didn't have a big significant difference between low and high. It kind of saturated at, uh, at a point, right? But to our surprise, when we use milk EVs in this breast cancer model, it accelerated metastasis and killed the mice faster in spite of reducing the primary tumor burden. As you can see here, this is the lung flux, which is looking at the luciferase. Uh, and you can see that uh, compared to the PBS, all the low on the uh, commercial milk high groups have significant metastasis in lungs, as you can see here with the luminescence. And also when you look at the qPCR based on m cherry, which is only present in the tumor cells, you can see that uh, even in lungs, you have high uh, m cherry in those milk administered group compared to this. And I have to mention here, this is not normalized to the primary tumor burden. If I normalize to the primary tumor burden, it would be even more higher, right? So this is just as it is. And you can also see the nodes in these lungs that are kind of more metastatic nodes in this milk administered group. So this is kind of quite um, uh, uh, discouraging because now we thought we had something for uh, uh, reducing the primary tumor and also metastasis, but this is going opposite where it is accelerating metastasis and killing the mice faster. So again, we were concerned with this uh, result and we wanted to um, kind of uh, ask the question, so what are we injecting back into the mice, right? So we kind of uh, sonicated the EVs and kind of ruptured the membrane. And we were able to show that when you sonicate the EVs, you can completely rescue the reduction in primary tumor, as well as uh, the metastatic effects in these EVs, suggesting that intact exosomes are important for them to survive the gut and also elicit the function in this context of reduction in primary tumor and also acceleration in metastasis. So um, um, we, uh, next we asked the question in terms of what happens to patients who are already going undergoing surgery? And if, if someone has gone surgery and uh, uh, can they consume milk, right? And this scenario, like uh, we use the same 41 breast cancer model 
where we did the orthotopic uh, model of uh, memory fat fat injection. And then after 10 to 12 days, we resected the primary tumor. And after two days, we started orally administrating milk weeds, right? So in this scenario, my hypothesis was uh, pretty much zero because based on my track record that uh, I've been completely predicting the opposite, uh, I kind of thought, let's be open in this scenario and then go ahead with uh, what the data says. Um, again, um, uh, to a surprise, again, uh, even though you kind of didn't want to be open and don't have a hypothesis, you'll still think what could happen in the result. And then when you think, I thought there may not be a big difference, but surprisingly, we can see compared to the PBS group, there was protection in reducing the metastatic burden in the milk consumed milk. So now when you remove the primary tumor burden, consumption of milk EBs is good for metastatic patients, which is really good, right? Again, consumption of milk EVs is context dependent and how they uh, regulate this metastatic effect is context, context dependent. And that's very, very interesting for us. And then we are pursuing this further uh, in a way. So we also tried other cancers, like for example, we used pancreatic cancer metastasis, KPC model. We see similar results. We also did uh, colorectal cancer, similar results. We also did uh, Kekoksik models where these are mainly based on xenograft models, but it's supposed to be reducing the uh, cachexia in these mice, predominantly because of uh, the xenograft models, right? So um, we also asked other questions of, can other EVs survive the gut? Some of you may be thinking like, am I including all the controls, right? What about non-milk EVs in this scenario? And that's one of the questions by the reviewers. Uh, and I had to rebut it saying like, uh, uh, this is not a drug delivery study because we are only looking at in cross species. If you consume something, what is the effect of that, right? And that's why we didn't have uh, other non-milk uh, EV controls. But however, I was curious as a scientist to see, can any other EV survive the gut? So we took, um, uh, like when you look at the diet-based cross species communication, you have milk EVs, there are quite a lot of amount of uh, EVs uh, uh, in milk. Uh, but we can also, some of the uh, uh, citrus or melon kind of fluids uh, or fruits can have a lot of EVs also, predominantly coming from broken cells as well as EVs in general. Uh, so they may have some high content, but uh, you need to be careful that you don't want to uh, throw something which is not physiologically relevant. Uh, and one of the reviewers asked us to use cancer EVs in the gut. And I was kind of thinking, what is the relevance of 1.5 grams of cancer EVs in a gut? of a person, right? Or even, um, uh, even a mice, right? Unless and until your meat the, the, that you're consuming has cancer and you, when you mince that into smaller bits, then you have some EVs coming from them and they have a functional role. We don't know that, right? But then we wanted to test this by looking at the next highly consumed beverage. And that's of course beer. We can see uh, beer, can other EVs survive the guts and beer? I can see, you can see Dolores here. Um, who consumes a lot of beer, and you also have a lot of kangaroos uh, consuming beer. So we wanted to ask this question, what if, can we consume beer and are they good for us in a way? Um, and then uh, when we looked at it, looked at here, when you looked at uh, two beers, which is uh, the standard concentration in Australia, uh, we got very low dosage of EVs in those beer when we used isolation protocols. And when we orally gavaged that beer into the mice, we could not see any signal. As you can see, the beer EVs uh, are not able to um, elicit any signal uh, due to their very low dosage. But when we put a high amount of yeast EVs, which is similar to 25 mg of the milk EVs, so you can see these are able to survive the gut and reach these organs. So this suggests that any EVs in high concentrations at least some of that can survive the gut and reach the tissues. And whether they have any functional response, uh, we, don't know that, we don't know that yet, but just uh, a curiosity-based thing suggests that yes, many other EVs can survive the gut. But however, to make this physiologically relevant, one person needs to count, uh, uh, consume somewhere like 7,000 beers a day for have to somewhere like 25 mg per kg, so which is not relevant, right? So just uh, showing you that uh, uh, this concept of cross-species communications can be true for some diet, but in other diet, it can be uh, completely extrapolated. So one has to be careful. 
So what is the mechanism? So now how does milk EVs do this opposite effect, right? So reducing primary tumor burden, but accelerating milk EVs. So I'm gonna keep, keep it short uh, because of the time limit. So what I'm going to summarize here is like, we did some MTAs assays of 41 with milk EVs. Uh, so what we saw was um, uh, it reduced the uh, uh, proliferation of the cells um, in a dose dependent way, but after a while it kind of saturated. You can see there's not a significant difference between the 100 and 200 micrograms. It saturates after a while. Um, and also we looked at whether there is any uh, cell death when you treat the cells with uh, uh, milk EVs. There's no caspase dependent cell that when you used QVD and saw there's no difference. We also looked at nec necrotopsis by using necrostatin inhibitor. There's no difference in necro necrotosis. Uh, and we also looked at autophagy dependent cell that by using ATG5 knockout CRISPR cells as well as bathylomycin. Uh, and also we used hydrochlorine, uh, hydrochlorine as well, which is uh, kind of when our Trump is famous for tweeting about uh, it being used in COVID-19 patients. Uh, and these suggest that uh, there's no cell death which is induced by, no significant cell death which is induced by milk EVs in those cancer cells. But however, when I looked at the saturation, like where there's no difference in um, proliferation after you increase the dosage, I kind of guessed that it could be because of senescence. And then when we tried this P16, uh, which is a marker of senescence, you can see untreated doesn't have P16, but 72 hours, you can see the senescence marker going up, suggesting that when you treat cancer cells with milk EVs, it induces cellular senescence in them. Uh, we also looked at the immune cells, like uh, again, the circulating and the infiltrating immune cells in these mice, which are consumed with milk and TBS. And we did not see a significant difference in any of these immune cell profiles, suggesting that they may not have a direct role in regulating this phenotype that we are seeing. And again, I have uh, uh, two, three supplementary figures to suggest this as well, but I'm showing a snapshot of what we see here in the immune cell uh, phenotype. So then we went back to proteomics where we kind of treated the cancer cells with and without milk EVs and subjected them to proteomics to see what are the proteins that are differentially abundant and what are the signaling pathways that are activated. To cut the long story short, what we found out was when you treated the milk EVs onto the cancer cells, we can see induction of this epithelial mesenchymal transition, which accelerates metastasis. And that's what we were able to validate in the primary tumor by immunofluorescence. We can see the PBS alone group. You can see Vimentin is less. Moment you put milk EVs, you can see the Vimentin expression is going up. And also the proliferation, which is uh, by Chi67 profile, is also going down. This could also be validated by the Western blotting on the primary tumor. You can see the Vimentin expression is going up. P16 is going up, suggesting that it induces cellular senescence and EMT in the primary tumor in vivo. So this is the model that we have, where we say that milk EVs is a double-edged sword, where in, in, in normally when you have metastasis, EMT occurs and the cancer cells go to the secondary site. When you have the intact primary tumor, when you give milk EVs, it induces senescence and accelerates EMT, thereby making the cancer cells to invade faster. But when you reset the primary tumor, uh, it is inducing senescence in the secondary site or the metastatic site, thereby not allowing them to grow. And that's why we see this opposite phenotype, right? So uh, I also want to finish with a cautionary note because EVs in milk is very high. So you need to be cautious, like uh, when you're talking about cross-species communication, uh, you have to be careful that other food sources may not be as applicable, maybe some food are. Uh, but uh, when you're uh, extrapolating like mushrooms or broccoli, you need to be careful in terms of suggesting that they, are, they may have a cross-species role in a way. And also I would like to mention this point on uh, use of xenograft model, uh, because if I just went on with xenograft model, my title would be milk EVs is good for cancer treatment and go ahead with that. But now as we use some syngenic and metastatic models and orthotopic metastatic models, we were able to kind of have a different result. And then this kind of creates uh, curiosity and one kind of stresses the need for right models to do these experiments. Uh, I'll also say that uh, Roche uh, and uh, PureTech are developing this platform for milk EVs for drug delivery uh, in July, and they got a $1 billion to use uh, that. And they are probably using in different contexts uh, in a way. Uh, I would probably finish off with thanking the people involved. And this is my group. And uh, the work was predominantly done by the PhD student Monisha Samuel, 
who is now postdocing in Karolinska, um, and also now uh, Rahul Sanwalni, who is continuing this pro continuing this project and taking this uh, further. And I would like to thank all the wonderful collaborators that we had in this project, without whom this project wouldn't be possible. And thank you all for your attention for listening. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Rush. Um, can I ask you to stop the share screen first? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, well, actually, I have one uh, pressing questions in my mind. So, um, how heterogeneous are they, the milk EV? Do you think they are, um, you know, as complex as um, what, well, it is mammalian cells, but um, have you looked into different markers and uh, compare them? Um, yes, uh, so um, that's a good question. So now uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity in milk EVs uh, because of various reasons, as I mentioned before. One uh, is, um, again, how they are processed, right? So some of the processing step also kind of breaks up the cells and then that can allow for some extra EVs that are formed uh, in, in, in the biofluid. Uh, and also, um, when we isolate them, uh, as we do by the crude way of uh, differential centrifugation and ultra centrifugation, uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity uh, in this vesicle population. But what is very, um, I would say, satisfying in this scenario is we have done this experiments like so many times, right? So, so many mm. times, almost mm. like 10 different batches. Uh, for all the animal experiments, and then every time it's reproducible, mm. uh, adjusting that uh, in spite of all this processing and, and all this uh, methodologies, these EVs conserve their function. And not only that, it is conserved in species. For example, mm. goat milk, um, buffalo milk, uh, sheep milk, all of them have the same functionality, which is very, very uh, interesting to study that. And uh, we don't know. Yeah, uh, I'll stop it there. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, so, so Suresh, I'm keeping my questions for later if we have time because I see there are several questions coming in. Yeah. Um, so, Regina Hill is the first one. Do you want to ask it directly or you want me to? Go ahead. Yeah, I, can, I can ask it. Uh, thank you. It was a great seminar. You kind of just got to the point I was asking about the source of the milk and if it actually mattered. Since you said humans generally, most people drink cow milk. So like if goat milk, other milk, um, is this something about, you know, kind of milk in general, the almond, the soy, the different percentage of fat. And I even had a follow-up question even about like human breast milk. Is this something that you've been able to test in other uh, types of milk? That's a wonderful question. So um, again, uh, we initially, when we started this project, we were trying to uh, um, get milk from every source, right? So it's almond, soy, as well as many animals. Like we were, believe it or not, we are trying to get uh, even uh, seal milk as well. Uh, we were trying to get kangaroo, everything, but we couldn't get hands to many of them. Uh, but I have to say here, like um, um, when we, we didn't try almond or soy milk in our hands, but we tried uh, these four milks, like for example, sheep, cow, buffalo, goat, uh, and horse, because these represent 99% of the world's consumption in terms of milk. And that's why we chose these alone. Uh, but we haven't selected the plant-based one. But your second question in terms of human milk, that is a very interesting concept because now the milk in cross species is regulating this phenotype. Can milk from the same species do that? And that's one of the questions I had for a long time. But unfortunately, um, I don't have the resources to collect milk from mice. Um, so I, I've, I've asked this question two, one and a half years ago to some of the people who has those resources and ask them, can you do this and check whether it is even the same case for the same uh, species? Um, I'm not sure about the answer for that, uh, but it's very interesting to study that actually. Uh, is uh, Adam McGuinness still on to ask the question? Adam? So there is a question from Adam McGuinness. Um, asking if you have applied the EVs to tissues in vitro, and if there is any difference in gene expression before, between in vitro and in vivo experiments, but I guess you've gone directly in vivo. Yeah, so uh, yeah. we have uh, done, uh, the question here is, like uh, as uh, Dolores mentioned, have EVs uh, kind of uh, applied to tissues in vitro, which means like he cells, 
Uh, and then also if there are difference in gene expression between in vivo and vitro, but we haven't compared per se. So we did do uh, tumor, uh, primary tumor, as well as we also did the uh, cell lines in vitro, uh, but we haven't compared them between, because we mainly focused on the in vitro data because we can control it. Uh, it's coming directly from milk kiwis, but in, uh, in vivo there are other secondary effects also, which can change the gene expression. And that's why we did not compare them uh, hand on hand. Uh, but that's a good idea. We can probably check that as well and see what is conserved and what is different. So next is a question from Ayesha Salem. Hi, uh, yeah. okay. I'm here. Hi, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you, have you tried putting in just bovine proteins? Is it the EVs that is causing the tumor loss or is it just the presence of bovine proteins whether inside the EVs or stuck on the outside? Uh, that's uh, again a good question because now we are trying to understand the mechanism. Like, say, one of the uh, concerns that we had in the bigger journals, for example, Nature Cell Science, all of them wanted me to tell one protein or one RNA that is doing this, right? Because that's their main point. So now, when we try to identify that, it is a hard question because now, when you um, do that in cell based conditions, you're trying to knock out a protein in the host cell. Uh, and then you take the exosomes without that protein or RNA, and then you're putting it on the recipient cell and see whether the function is conserved or not. But in this scenario, I need transgenic cows to study that, right? We can't uh, directly go and knock out a protein or RNA in this uh, milk. But uh, uh, we tried some recombinant proteins that we can get hands to. Uh, for example, there are not many recombinant proteins that are available like lactotransferrin, albumin, and many other things. Uh, they are not eliciting the function. So one other protein that we are very much interested in is TGF beta. So TGF beta, there's a lot of TGF beta in this milk kiwis and TGF beta is known to induce EMT in uh, cancer cells. So we thought all this mechanism is driven by TGF beta, but uh, when we put recombinant TGF beta, it is not inducing P16 or uh, EMT expression in the cells. Um, so we could not confidently articulate that is driven by TGF beta. So we tried many other things it didn't work. Uh, one other thing that people could do is try to do it on the recipient cell, meaning put inhibitors or knock out certain certain genes in the recipient cells. But in that context, you can only claim that the function is dependent on that particular gene. Like for example, if I knock out TGF beta on the recipient cell, TGF beta receptor, uh, I can see it could also change the uptake of EVs on the cells. So I cannot say it is driving it. I can say it's dependent on it. So that's why you can never get a, a perfect answer in this particular milk-based one. And that's why we couldn't follow it up much. Yeah. Our next question is from Nikki. Uh, Nikki, are you there? Yes, I'm here, um, Shares. So my question for you is, um, have you looked at any additional senescent markers besides P16? Because it would be interesting if you are inducing a secretory, the senescence associated secretory phenotype in those cells. Yes, so we do see uh, MMP2 go up in the, uh, in the primary tumor uh, in, of those cells. Um, we haven't looked at the secreted fraction um, per se uh, in, from the cells, but also we see that PRB, the retinoblastoma, the phosphoretinoblastoma gene also uh, go down. Uh, but these are uh, the only two genes we looked at at, at the moment. But the P16 expression is consistent across cancer cell lines. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Okay. Next question is from Muhammad about RNA. Muhammad? Thank you very much for the uh, nice talk. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is regarding uh, your uh, first background when you mentioned, you kindly mentioned that this dietary RNAs uh, and uh, they were controversial then and uh, cross uh, species uh, communications via dietary elements. So when we uh, see this tumor burden was reduced by EVs, so were there, have you tried or your group tried to identify some tumor suppressor microRNA or some RNAs that are targeting the tumors or and uh, my second question is when we talk about biodistribution, uh, sorry, it's my way to I, I mean you, um, when you talk about uh, biodistribution uh, and, uh, and you have identified uh, certain uh, protein 
and that were specific to Boeing. So that's your group identified in tumor, but have you also identified separately as a control group only milk EVs? So um, uh, for, for the first question, uh, have you looked at uh, dietary RNAs in, in, in these uh, milk? Uh, we did look at uh, RNAs as a whole, but we haven't chased up on any particular RNA uh, in this particular study. The reason being, when you look at this cross-species communication, uh, there is not even one single study on proteins. Everyone has focused on RNA, right? So, and that's where the cell was. And we kind of focused from the start, uh, we probably look at proteins because that's our forte, the proteomics uh, in our hands. So we, that's why we haven't focused too much on RNAs, what RNAs could cause this, whether there's any tumor suppressor RNAs or are there any uh, RNAs which could also induce senescence or EMT. We haven't checked that at all completely, not done any work on that. Uh, I have to accept that. So the second question you're asking whether we check whether uh, any proteins in the biodistribution and when you check about the biodistribution and you deliver the EVs, uh, you deliver the milk and uh, the tumor burden was reduced and uh, you checked in the liver and then there were proteins that were specific to bovine. Yeah. And uh, then my question was, have you also checked with milk that was not delivered, just milk, and you check the proteins in that milk as a control? Yeah, so that's a, so we haven't done that particular experiment in terms of biodistribution, but we have done the same experiment um, with, uh, uh, for this moment, I'll share, uh, one second, I'll share this slide because it's pretty interesting data. Um, so in a way, um, I'll get to that. Um, so in a way, uh, it's pretty interesting because uh, uh, I'll ask this question in other way. Other way is, can whole milk have the same function? Right, so in a way, like instead of this, I'm just going to ask this whole milk has the function. So this is the data where uh, we here is the data in the mice. You can see the PBS alone group has the tumor volume as it is. And when you put the whole milk, which is the purple plot here, it still also reduces the primary tumor burden similar to the, uh, the commercial milk EVs. Right. But when you deplete the EVs from the whole milk and substitute everything other than EVs, there's no function, the green one, right? Suggesting that, yes, the whole milk has also the same function as EVs. But however, when you remove the EV fraction from the milk, the milk is not functional anymore as similar to the tumor milk. And that would answer the question. But uh, uh, in a way, like we haven't looked at uh, the proteins per se, whether the whole milk also would reach, but based on this functional data, we would expect that also happens. Maybe they have some tumor suppressor protein, just one effect. Like when you talk about the protein, there are not RNA, and then proteins are also tumor suppressor. There's a lot. There's a lot of protein suppressor proteins in there. Like for, that's why I said lactotransferrin has been already been implicated in like a carrier as well as they're also talking about uh, uh, using that as a tumor uh, tumor suppressor. But uh, in a way, like uh, we couldn't, when you rupture the EVs, you lose the function. So they have to be intact. But uh, it's very hard as for, for us to, recombinant proteins don't have the function. So if you tag them with the lipopro, lip, uh, lipoparticles, it may, but we haven't gone to that path at the moment. Um, so we haven't tried those. So the next question um, is from Will Otam. Do you want to yeah. ask it directly? Hi, I know, thank you, it's a fantastic talk. Um, so I've just got a few sort of small questions. The first was on your NTA data with the characterization of the EVs. Um, one of them was you seem to have sort of about tenfold more EVs in the conditioned milk. Um, why do you sort of think that is? So the, the commercial milk, uh, because of the processing, so you would expect that uh, uh, you would get more uh, EVs in there because now there are some cells which are intact uh, in these EVs and de depending on their processing, some may remove the cells much earlier, some may not, uh, and they cannot centrifuge these milk for, a, uh, for, 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 for the amount of milk they generate. So in a way, when the processing happens, uh, you tend to kind of have break open some of these and then the cells may form particles as well and that's what we see. Uh, and then uh, RM, so we haven't, to be honest, we haven't compared them one on to one together. The reason being, if you have the same source of milk, right, and then you yeah. subject them to homogenization, saturation, then you can compare one is to one. 
and that's why we uh, didn't do that because the milk has to come the same source same cow and then you do the same preparation then you can compare and that's why i didn't want to make big judgments with that okay yeah um a follow-up question to that was when you did your isolate isolation you said there was quite a lot of heterogeneity between in your sample have you sort of considered going forward adding a filtration step in there as well sort of at the end so, uh, we, so we do an ultra filtration we do ultra filtration on every sample uh, because of the bacteria in there right so you oh, okay. you do know that uh, the milk EVs have uh, milk has a lot of bacteria and then we don't want them in the cell culture uh, uh, conditions and also in our uh, mice so we try to remove all the bacteria in them by using ultra ultra filtration anyway Okay. And then the last question was on the biodistribution of the EVs. Um, you showed it was a really nice study on showing how they located in the liver, the EVs. Have you done anything looking at the EV clearance in the liver and sort of how long they reside there? Um, so probably not uh, clearance per se, but uh, as you asked, this, uh, this is a good question, actually, uh, because uh, uh, we, we looked at... Um, see them like any other person right so um i'll kind of go to the time right yeah so we looked at serum like any other person but however when you looked at the serum um we kind of uh, did not um pick up uh let's say at 24 hours in the serum so we kind of uh, proposed that probably it's too late we could have done it earlier and that's why we're not able to pick it up but this slide here kind of shows the uh, biodistribution parts as 2 hours, 6 hours, 24 and 48 hours. You can see at 48 hours, you can see a diminishing signal in the liver, but 24 hours, the signal is pretty high, right? Okay. Uh, but when you do it seven days continuously, like every day you're giving it for seven days, you can see almost every organ lights up, right? So every day you give one dosage for seven days. Uh, that suggests that probably the uh, there is uh, uh, retained in the system. But however, we haven't studied the um, pretty much the clearance um, that's a hard thing to study actually um, yeah. but we've studied in this way that's all i would say yeah. all right thank you very much no problem thanks so um we have only very few minutes left and last but not least we have an interesting question from dr askenaze phil can you go on hey phil nice to see you your, your mic is uh, need to be unmuted. You, um, yeah, can you unmute? I gotta find that. Yeah, we can, we can hear you now. Pardon me? We can hear you now, you can ask a question still. Okay. Good to see you, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm interested in uh, whether the proteins or the RNAs are causing the functional changes you see. Um, so if, uh, we don't know uh, a short answer, but uh, if you ask me, I'm a proteomics guy, so I'll say proteins. Um, so but, uh, it could be if you ask uh, some of the RNA guys, like say Nawaz here, he will say RNA. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in this, pro probably I would say it, it is a combination of both. Um, we don't know which are the precise protein or RNA to do that. Uh, so one kind of request I have here for the people here is, uh, when you look at some of these studies, um, uh, don't try to uh, ask the question of what protein or RNA to the review uh, to the paper in as a review. Why? Because this, uh, because any study that you have seen in literature, if you articulate that one protein or one RNA is driving this particular function, um, I'm not sure how true they are. Because when you knock out a protein and uh, isolate the EVs from the cell and then incubate on the recipient cell and then say I abolish the function, you could change a lot. You can change the uptake of the protein. You can change some of the cargo that is differentially packaged as well, thereby changing the function completely. So I would be not 100% sure if someone claims that this one protein is doing this function. Right? However, in our hands, in other studies, we can show one protein or one RNA driving some phenotype. But in this case, we don't know. think that one thing would do would do it in the situation in our system as you may recall we're working with exosomes from suppressive t-cells yeah and we've identified that microRNA 150 is it 
with uh, knockout, knockouts and the ability to associate ex exogenous. And now we've gone orally. Uh, we had a paper about casein. You might not have noticed there was experiments in there yeah. in which we yeah. were able to give them orally and they were superior to other roots. And we have a paper we're going to submit soon in the ovalbumin system where we can make everything clonal. And, and again, the micro 150 seems the whole thing. And for the opposition, there's, there's this uh, idea that it's not enough microRNA, so how could it be? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think probably uh, in, in our case, there may be proteins in the background that are doing very important things, but you need this particular microRNA to complete the set. Yeah, I agree. The, the context uh, definitely is important and uh, many people uh, some of the people like uh, who we know that they are very, very thorough, like yourself, uh, they have shown that a single molecule can um, kind of regulate this phenotype. Um, I really appreciate that, but uh, definitely um, we haven't looked at it in that way. So that's probably a, a future direction. But we, whatever we try didn't work. Let me put it in that way. We did spend somewhere like uh, one year almost on chasing up individual molecule, individual RNA did not work. So we had to give up. Uh, so that's the yeah. We, we got we got lucky uh, with uh, the cloning that we did, things like that. It's yeah. wonderful that you have resurrected Shen Yu Zhang's original work with rice, uh, for which he received a really as terrible, terrible criticisms by people who really hadn't reproduced his experiments. They went off and did other experiments. Yeah. You have reproduced his experiments and yeah. done a very thorough job. That's right. So, but one of the problems, as you would. Yeah, one of the problem with Zhang study is uh, because of um, the RNA seq, the coverage is pretty poor. And that's one of the problem of that study. And that's why a lot of people criticize it. If the coverage is pretty good, uh, I think uh, uh, it would have been even more stronger. But uh, yeah, the RNA seq at that time wasn't that great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the questions. It's a very interesting talk. And thanks so much, Suresh, for giving us a great presentation and share your result with us.